This evening, I am honored to have the opportunity to welcome our distinguished Congressman, Lloyd Doggett, who is visiting our campus for the, for the second time in a few months. Uh, in early April, Congressman Doggett led an immigration forum uh, that some of you may have uh, attended. The forum brought together some uh, leaders of San Antonio's business, ad business advocacy and faith communities, all who are working towards uh, overhauling our broken immigration system. Lloyd Doggett is a product of uh, Texas public education and is every, uh, as is every member of his family. He graduated first in his class from the University of Texas School of uh, Business and with honors from the UT School of Law. Elected as state senator at age 26, he worked closely as a legislator with educators for 11 years to strengthen public education. He served six years as justice on the Texas Supreme Court, which is our state's highest court. Prior to his election to Congress, he was named outstanding judge in Texas by the Mexican American Bar of Texas. Now as our US representative, as our US congressman, he listens to us and has consistently worked for fairness and equity for every constituent. And Congressman, we certainly hope that you will continue visiting uh, us here in the college and the campus. You're always welcome here. And with that, with that, please join me in welcoming Congressman Lloyd Doggett. Thank you, thank you Well, thank you so very much. We did have a, uh, a very uh, successful immigration forum that uh, Dr. Harriet Romo and a number of other people participated in uh, not so long ago. And I'll touch back on immigration, but uh, I want to uh, discuss with you uh, a number of issues. I will say that uh, I question a little bit the term lecture. Uh, having been away from the university for a while, I think of the many lectures uh, that uh, I hear in Washington and the fact that uh, my feeling is that members of Congress perhaps uh, lecture too much and listen too little. Uh, and are surrounded uh, by certified smart people of a wide range of uh, political philosophies uh, with credentials uh, and certification. Uh, obviously, in, in many cases, very intelligent people uh, with the credentials, but who perhaps lack the insight and the expertise in the struggles uh, of ordinary American families, of middle class families, and of the many people who are not in the middle class but struggling on the first rungs of the economic ladder, hoping to be in the middle class and to share a more in the American dream. Uh, I'd like, therefore, to devote most of my time to listening to your questions and comments, uh, but uh, I will offer a few observations first about a Congress that has historically low ratings uh, and in the aftermath of an absolutely outrageous government shutdown that we endured recently. Why are we in this circumstance? Uh, there are many reasons, but I would uh, comment uh, on three. Lines, money, and myths. As far as the lines, uh, I'm talking about the lines that are drawn for congressional districts. Uh, personally, through the redistricting process, uh, I've had the opportunity to represent a great deal of Texas, just not all at the same time. I was originally elected to represent almost all 98% of a single county. Uh, at one point, I was extended so that I had more of the border of, along with Mexico than any member of the Texas delegation, save one. And then I went east to Houston uh, and now I have the good fortune of including the campus that we're in uh, with an area that winds up I-35 to the north end of Austin. I have to admit that but for Governor Perry's uh, redistricting schemes, I would never have experienced my first rattlesnake roundup in Freer or the first uh, Vaquero Festival in Hebronville or the Chili Spiel in uh, Flatonia uh, and lots of Fiesta events right here. Uh, but that redistricting process, I think, has had a significant impact on more than me on, and indeed on the whole framing of the national debate that is going on right now. During the last election, Democrats won over a million votes more than Republicans. 
but because of the way districts are designed, the Republicans got 33 more members of the House of Representatives than the Democrats did. Uh, for the most part, here in Texas, uh, a Republican member of Congress has nothing to fear from a Democrat, uh, but uh, he or she uh, may face significant fears uh, from the right, so that from my perspective, the Republican Party uh, becomes a party of the far right and the not so right. Uh, taking uh, very reasonable and responsible positions on issues such as maintaining the full faith and credit of the United States or trying to, to achieve some balanced immigration reform becomes very politically risky uh, for Republican office holders when the district is so unbalanced that the only fear of a challenge is from the Tea Party in a very uh, restricted uh, in size uh, Republican primary. And that's why, though Ted Cruz got uh, most of the fame or infamy, depending on your perspective, in the recent government shutdown, uh, every House member who was a Republican from Texas essentially voted the same way against the uh, Senate continuing resolution to reopen the government. And with the exception of a very competitive district that Congressman Gallego is in from uh, the southwestern part of the county and the north northern part of the county all the way to El Paso, uh, and another district that stretches from uh, Galveston to Beaumont and has about 20 percent Latino population and about 20 percent African American population, the possibility other than in those two districts of changing the composition of the membership of the Texas congressional delegation is not great. Across America, I think the same reality uh, largely prevails. There are 232 congressional districts that are represented by Republicans. Governor Romney carried 215 of them. And so if you're trying to bring about change uh, in one of those districts, uh, you're really looking at a relatively small number that can be the focus of an electoral, likely electoral change uh, next year in the elections. And that brings me to the second factor, uh, money. Certainly not anything new or particularly insightful. It's always been said that money is the, money, the mother's milk of politics. But our campaigns at every level have become so expensive uh, that the amount of, amounts of money being expended uh, in our elections uh, is incredible. And increasingly, those contributions are secretive, uh, so that it's difficult to tell who's really uh, making decisions in these elections. Uh, some issues, as a result, never get addressed in Washington. They just never get on the agenda. And when issues are addressed, they're often stymied because of the influence of money in politics, uh, or the, uh, the whole debate is distorted by that. And you find members of Congress of both parties looking at the, the calendar for the day, seeking a portion of each day when the debate and the, the time for votes, because you, they usually get clustered in the House, uh, are looking for call time. And call time means that period when you go down and make your calls often to people you've never met or heard of to ask them to make contributions uh, to your campaign. Uh, members uh, devote an inordinate amount of time to that uh, rather than to consideration of all the intricacies of policies uh, that were called to vote upon. Only very recently, during the time that I've served in Congress, the focus of many reformers when we approved what was called the McCain-Feingold uh, legislation, as in John McCain, was on putting some reasonable caps on some uh, forms of contributions. Now uh, the focus has shifted uh, to disclosure because of the decisions of the United States Supreme Court and Citizens United and another case that is pending before the court right now concerning the overall cap on total contributions in federal campaigns. Uh, there's been a serious uh, limitation on our ability to reform this system. Treating unlimited amounts of money as speech, which is what this court by a vote of one appears to be committed to doing, uh, really limits our ability 
uh, to prevent money from dominating this system. Uh, the effort to get disclosure has been thwarted by some who, when we were debating McCain-Feingold, said we don't need limitations, we just need disclosure. Now they oppose disclosure as well. And it's often difficult to tell whether citizens for good government, citizens for a healthy uh, San Antonio, uh, is a, a group of polluters uh, or a group of people that are not interested in the subject that their committee uh, whatever the political philosophy or the issue at any level of government is about. That disclosure strikes me as being uh, critical uh, to the operation of our, our democracy and finding ways to overcome uh, excessive amounts of money in politics is, remains a really big challenge. Third thing that I point to are myths. Congress and our national debate right now uh, is based in many cases on mythology and ideology. Uh, when I first uh, got to the Capitol, uh, I had uh, never been on the floor of the Congress before. Uh, I uh, had always lived here in Texas. And so I looked for some staff members who'd been there a while and might kind of teach me the ropes on some of these things back in the 90s. Uh, and one very experienced uh, staffer who'd worked for the House Rules Committee told me the first thing you need to remember is that in Washington, everyone's entitled to their own facts. Well, um, I found that to be largely true. Uh, you know, if you have a, in the healthcare system, uh, someone who ignores evidence-based medicine, uh, they're gonna be uh, uh, likely to be charged with malpractice. And if you have an architect who graduates from here at UTSA or an engineer and they they design only for their aspirations and don't consider the numbers, uh, their buildings collapse. But in Congress, on many issues, uh, ignoring the, whether the numbers add up uh, and ignoring evidence-based policies uh, has become a way of life. I think one of the best examples of that is the debate over climate change and global warming. Uh, I, and there is, uh, I noted today, uh, uh, a good short uh, op-ed by Lanny Sinkin, who is the executive director of Solar San Antonio in the Express News, and there have been uh, some others previously. Uh, the, uh, the climate change debate is not just about polar bears or what's happening in Greenland. It's about what's happening in what will not be a very green land right here in San Antonio. Uh, I have uh, now uh, been around long enough that I have three young granddaughters. I know they will live according to the 90, I think it's to the 97% of, uh, of accuracy uh, from the, this latest scientific uh, report that's about to come out uh, through uh, an international committee that looked at climate change before and uh, actually won a Nobel Prize a few years ago. They're about to come out with their next report. The impact right here in Texas of desertification, of a receding coastline, of increased illnesses uh, and disease possibilities as a result of climate change. Uh, a reference yesterday, uh, lead story in, or, or Saturday I believe, lead story in the New York Times about the impact on our food supply of changes. Uh, the likelihood that we can see as much as a 2% decline every decade in overall food production in the world at a time of growing population and the need for greater food will make a difference in the grocery bill and the access to food. Many parts of the world are already experiencing uh, challenges uh, in terms of fighting over limited resources. And I think we face uh, tremendous uh, challenges during the, that my granddaughters will see during their lives and it's not that the science isn't clear, it's not that there aren't facts, but that some people uh, kind of view this climate change, the debate, uh, the way uh, somebody whose pension hadn't invested who worked for a tobacco company about whether tobacco causes disease. Uh, very colored by, in that process, and climate change is not the only example where facts and evidence-based uh, activity seem to make very little uh, impact in our debate in Washington. What can you do about it, and uh, how can you make a difference? 
Well, I continue to find inspiration from uh, Robert F. Kennedy's speech during a visit to apartheid-dominated South Africa in the 1960s. He said, few will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events. In the total of all these acts will be written the history of a generation. And then a, a portion of that speech uh, was inscribed uh, in the memorial to him in Arlington Cemetery. Each time a person stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot, lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he or she sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring those ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Being a part of that ripple of hope is what I think we got to do. There are a number of people who give up on the process of democracy and yield it uh, to those who have perhaps more crass aims in the process. And uh, I, I know during the, the time I've been in Congress, save uh, a really four years when my party had a majority almost every day. It's a matter of going over and knowing what the outcome will be of the debate and what the, uh, that the votes will not be there uh, for the causes that I advocate, but being a part of that democracy. And I think being, uh, uh, trying to send out those ripples of hope at a time of great cynicism about our government is particularly critical. Uh, I, uh, I, I feel I owe a, a great deal here to UTSA in that regard. I've got uh, one intern after another who's come from the UTSA campus, both here uh, and uh, in Washington. I'm pleased to be joined by Lisa Marie Gomez, who uh, helped start my office and is now back at UTSA School of Business. Andrew Solano, who uh, took over her uh, job uh, with uh, the operation of our office, which is down uh, just the other side of Santa Rosa, across from the Frost Drive-In, is a UTSA graduate, and uh, introduced me to some of his uh, faculty, the, the faculty members that uh, he taught with here. Uh, we have uh, uh, interns working in the Washington office right now through the Congressional Hispanic Institute that uh, have been uh, valuable in the operation of our office. Uh, some of my former interns, I must say, uh, have turned out pretty well. Uh, one from the, uh, my days on the Supreme Court now sits as a, Nelva Ramos, uh, sits as a federal judge in Corpus Christi. Uh, some of you have seen uh, Paul Begala on CNN, uh, who began in my state senate office, and many others are participating with those ripples of hope in other ways, not as full-time elected officials, but as full-time committed citizens of our democracy who are doing a wide range of other things in business, uh, education, uh, and uh, find time to be involved, whether it's a school board election uh, or uh, participating in elected office. The uh, uh, last time I was here was to, uh, as Azeem mentioned, to talk about immigration. Uh, and as I look forward to the next two months in the Congress. We reconvene uh, next Monday, next Tuesday, actually, after uh, Veterans Day. Uh, immigration is the one subject that I still think there is some, one major subject that there is still some hope that we might achieve reform on. As you know, we began uh, the year with a concerted bipartisan effort in the Senate uh, to produce a comprehensive immigration bill. A bill passed the Senate with 68 votes and was a bipartisan bill, mostly Democratic, but a significant number of key Republican senators backing it. Uh, we've been unable to get any movement in the House or to even get a bill out of committee. Some of our colleagues that are opposed to immigration reform fear even a bill that is a security-only immigration bill, a border security-only immigration bill, that if it is approved uh, in the House, that it will go to conference with the Senate, and out of that conference committee will come something other than border security only that they don't want to see approved in the way of immigration legislation. 
Uh, we have, therefore, because no bill could be moved after trying a, a bipartisan approach from a similar group to the Gang of Eight in the Senate, which began as a Gang of Eight in the House and then became seven and then became five uh, with only one Republican, uh, to go forward with a bill that took verbatim all of the Senate bipartisan legislation except for the provisions on border security, which many people question, and substituted for it a bill that had passed unanimously out of the House Homeland Security Committee by a Republican and put that into the bill and offered it as a new bipartisan comprehensive bill in the Senate, excuse me, in the House. Uh, that legislation has now picked up its last week its third Republican sponsor, along with uh, about 186 Democrats. We're hoping that over the next couple of weeks, we pick up just a few more, because I think as we go over the 200 or the 215 mark, it really builds the pressure for the House to act. It's not as if the House lacked the time to consider this or a number of other issues. In between fundraising and naming post offices and renaming uh, buildings, there is plenty of time between now and Christmas uh, to undertake immigration and a number of other issues. I believe that ultimately the only way that we can pass uh, an immigra a comprehensive immigration bill is the only way we ended the government shutdown, the only way we got off the fiscal cliff on the first day of this year, the only way we could pass the Violence Against Women Act, uh, and that is, uh, actually it was the only way we could uh, get relief to Hurricane Sandy victims in the Northeast after some of my Republican colleagues got mad at Governor Christie, uh, and that is to let a majority of the House rule on these issues. Uh, normally, in House procedure, and only rarely uh, does this not apply, the only bills that can be debated on the floor are bills that have the approval of a majority of the Republican caucus. In the, on the issues that I mentioned, uh, reopening the government and resolving the latest crisis, at least for a short time, or the Violence Against Women Act, uh, we were able to be given essentially a free vote where uh, a significant number of Democrats and a number but not a majority of Republicans could approve a measure. And that's what allowed us to resolve a crisis. That's where we are in terms of immigration, I believe, and I'm hopeful that before the end of the year, if there's enough involvement, especially from the business community, if we can't appeal to people through their hearts on some of these issues, we need to appeal to their pocketbooks because the economic potential of immigration reform is far-reaching. And so I'm hopeful that we can see some action in this Congress on that issue, even if we cannot resolve all the others. With that, uh, and seeing uh, the time, I'd like to uh, invite your questions and comments on any issues that you might want to raise before Congress uh, or uh, uh, facing our democracy in general. Who'd like to lead off? Yes, sir. Thank you. Are you here at UTSA? Great. I think that uh, we promoted some unity when, as I said, uh, we, the, the rule was relaxed, an exception was made uh, to allow a majority of the House to decide what would happen rather than blocking a majority of the House from acting on the government shutdown. I think that there are many commentators who look at what's been happening in Congress, particularly over the government shutdown and the threat of default and saying, why can't they get along? Uh, they just, uh, they're not cooperating. They're not thinking about the good of the country and that it's a personality thing. It's really not that. Uh, this was a calculated decision by some that after an agreement, uh, at least generally, had been reached between Speaker Boehner, 
and Majority Leader Reed that we would compromise and accept a much reduced level of funding for education, uh, mental health, medical research, and a number of other issues in return for continuing to have the government open and not threatening the good credit rating of the United States, uh, they changed their mind and decided that this was a good opportunity to extort a result that they wanted. Uh, and so Senator Cruz, and uh, particularly, and some others decided we will use this. We have some leverage. We ought not to give it up, not because they didn't like uh, others or they were quarrelsome, but because they saw it as a tool in their toolkit to achieve their ends. The result was a miserable failure, fortunately, and they did not achieve their objectives. Uh, but I think it's difficult to achieve true unity uh, because we have very different perspectives about what is in the best interest for the future of the country. We need to allow majority rule but with respect for minority rights, recognizing that there's no party that has a monopoly on truth. But in this case, I think that the whole process was really hijacked at great expense, particularly to civilian workers uh, at our military installations here, without any thought to what the impact was uh, on their lives, uh, and uh, a, a, a tactic that I believe Senator McConnell, for example, has been clear he does not want to see happen again. Uh, whether it happens again is not yet determined. Uh, we have now, as you know, a budget committee that is a, a, kind of a super committee of the Senate Budget Committee and some representatives of the House that are supposed to make recommendations by December 13th. And if we don't pass another resolution by January 15th, uh, and if we don't address the full faith and credit of the United States with the debt ceiling a month later, we could face these problems again. I hope a lesson has been learned. Uh, the other thing I would say is that uh, while I deplore the tactic that was used uh, and, uh, uh, and believe it achieved nothing for those that used it other than a perhaps a lot of publicity and, and to even lower the already low ratings of Congress, some of what's happening in Congress really reflects deep divisions in the country about what the future of our country should be and whether uh, what, what level of participation, what level of government regulation uh, and delivery of government services is appropriate at this time in American life. Uh, and I respect that there are differences on that I just think that the system is distorted because of some of the, the factors I mentioned initially uh, and by lower levels of participation of people who think that it can't make any difference for them to participate in the first place given the factors I mentioned and how you keep those ripples of hope going and that involvement uh, in order to build a stronger country that if not totally unified is at least respectful of other opinions uh, is a big challenge for us, and, but it is essential to the future of our democracy. Yes, sir. Thank you. I just want to ask, uh, how important do you think the deficit is as an issue, and you know, what should be done about it? Uh, the question is, and I'm sorry not to have repeated the uh, earlier one for those who are watching us through NowCast, which we're pleased to have here tonight, uh, has to do about the significance of the deficit uh, and what we do about it. I served for a number of years on the House Budget Committee, and uh, I am concerned about the long-term impact of uh, uh, our government finances. I don't want the single biggest uh, expenditure of the government uh, to be uh, payments on interest uh, for our debt. At the same time, I recognize that over the short term, big changes, big reductions uh, in uh, the level of spending have not worked that well in Europe, in some of the countries that have tried that approach, and have actually had the effect of increasing deficits to the extent that they reduce economic growth. I don't know that we can grow our way out of all these problems, but I am uh, convinced of the error of those who say that in Washington we don't have a taxing problem, we have only a spending problem. We cannot provide 
uh, educational opportunity for our citizens, a reasonable level of student financial assistance, and a reasonable level of investment in education, and what I view as our future competitiveness against uh, uh, people from countries all over the world, unless we provide an adequate level of funding for those purposes. The same is true of basic research, medical research, uh, that are getting shortchanged. And I think it is a, a, a matter of some balance in how those cuts happen. And right now, the focus has been pretty much on the cuts, uh, not on getting the revenues. I heard uh, Paul Ryan, who I uh, last year was sitting, I guess, three, four seats apart from on the Budget Committee, uh, saying that any kind of additional uh, revenues were off the table in the Budget Committee discussions that are supposed to produce a result on the 13th of December. Uh, I don't think you can make the numbers work uh, unless you're willing to look at some additional revenues. And I think you have to look at uh, every one of the many uh, loopholes in our federal tax law, which is such a mess, and ask whether those tax expenditures that we make through the tax code are justified versus the need to fund research, mental health, uh, educational opportunity. Uh, and so, yes, the deficit is important, but it ought not to be the only thing that we rely on in determining public policy and to address too much too fast, uh, I believe, would create more problems than it would resolve. I will tell you that I, uh, I had the opportunity back at the time that all the Bush tax cuts were pushed through to ask some questions of Alan Greenspan in the House Ways and Means Committee. And at that time, his position was uh, that we needed to adopt the Bush tax cuts because we were bringing down the deficit so much that it would interfere with the bond market over time and that we wouldn't have uh, enough federal debt if we didn't do that. It hadn't worked out quite exactly that way. Uh, and But for uh, that massive round of tax cuts we wouldn't and, and two unpaid wars, we wouldn't have some of the problems we have today. Uh, when I look at uh, issues that are advanced uh, and may come up in this budget committee in terms of retirement security. Uh, whether uh, a veteran on disability, uh, a senior citizen, should have the adjustments that are made because of increase in the price of groceries and inflation from what the cost of living index is now is, is difficult to, uh, to defend. The president has indicated some willingness to to go along with Republicans at one point on that. I just can't defend making those changes solely for uh, deficit reduction uh, when the cost of living increases that have been received over the last several years are so modest. Uh, and, uh, and so, yes, we need to, to try to get some savings in our retirement programs, but how we achieve them is very, very uh, difficult, and the impact on those who rely on those programs uh, is uh, is potentially severe. Yes, sir. Right. And again, for our now cast audience, the question is uh, Republicans who really see the wisdom of comprehensive immigration reform but are worried that they'll be attacked uh, for supporting it. Indeed, really, that's my uh, first essential point about lines and how these districts have been drawn so that that's all they have to fear. They don't really, in many cases, fear any Democratic opposition, but they're afraid that the know-nothing party of today, uh, reappearing from the 19th century, uh, fearing immigration, uh, will, uh, will challenge them in a primary. Uh, I think by appealing to them principally through their pocketbook and talking about the economic impact, the very favorable economic impact. In fact, San Antonio was cited in a recent United States Chamber of Commerce uh, report about immigration as being a city that uh, demonstrates 
how much immigration can help drive economic growth. Uh, after one very flawed study through heritage, I think almost every uh, economic study has shown that getting people out of the shadows uh, will help grow small business, will help grow opportunities, will encourage people to participate fully uh, in our uh, economy and in our society. There was, in fact, uh, when I arrived in Washington a weekend ago, there were some people with build large uh, handmade signs just outside National Airport, and their signs were all directed not at people like me, but a group of business leaders who were coming in to talk to Republicans about this very issue. They were kind of the know-nothing part of the Republican Party, uh, protesting the fact that a business group was coming in to meet with Republicans. We need more of those business groups, and we need more involvement right here at the local level, talking about what is the impact on the real estate market, on new business development and the like of doing this. Uh, and I think that's probably the only way that will get us there, though I do believe uh, that the involvement of a wide range of religious groups uh, in appealing on, uh, from faith, the faith groups is also very important in that coalition. So it is a matter of, uh, of, of talking about it both pocketbook and heart, but I think the pocketbook is really important in winning over uh, some of our Republican colleagues. Yes, sir. Probably uh, not great any time in the near future, but uh, I do think that's an important move. Yes, in California, because they have initiative and referendum, and citizens could put something on the ballot, a proposal that was put on the ballot that had considerable Democratic opposition uh, from office holders. But it's gone into place. Uh, the same fellow who told me that uh, uh, in Washington, everyone's entitled to their own facts, also uh, made the truism that you can't take politics out of politics. And uh, that's true of the redistricting process. It's not that a citizens committee totally removes the political process, how that committee is selected and the like uh, can make a really big difference. But I think in uh, states that have had citizens committees, in California most recently, but previously, for example, in Iowa, uh, I believe in New Jersey as well, but certainly uh, a handful of states, I think there's been a better result and there have been more competitive districts uh, that allow for change and encourage members to be a little more balanced in their outlook to try to reflect their constituents. How you get to that, uh, it's possible that uh, there could be some things that the Congress itself could do uh, to uh, encourage that in federal elections, uh, but the chances, just like on the money end of things, of getting people elected under the current system to vote to change that system, probably uh, very difficult. Uh, I'd like to see uh, the process here. Actually, former Republican State Senator Jeff Wentworth advocated a nonpartisan system uh, and, and got, uh, I think, it to a vote in the Texas Senate uh, not a nonpartisan system, but a, but a citizens committee similar in, in general terms to what was done in California, uh, but it never, uh, never got out of the Texas legislature. It will take uh, people from both parties uh, in order to get change and uh, maybe the revulsion that some of the things that have happening will drive that, but I think it's a very long process and not likely to happen soon in Texas. Other... Uh, Comments or questions? Yes, sir. The Affordable Health Care Act is now in the law of the land, and it remains to be seen of what the impacts on the African American community be. What are your thoughts on the Care Act as it is structured now? How much do you think it is a question is about the Affordable Care Act. What changes should be made? What do I think about it? Uh, I was on uh, the committee that wrote part of the Affordable Care Act. 
Uh, I had the first protest in the country uh, as the act was being considered in our committee where uh, a large number of Tea Party folks showed up at uh, what I call neighborhood office hours, similar to the coffee I had with uh, Diego Bernal here on Saturday and, and we'll be doing with uh, several other members of the San Antonio City Council over coming weeks here. And they showed up to yell and scream against the Affordable Health Care Act. And as I told them then, I wish it were as good as they think it is bad. Uh, it's not. <laughs> It has many limitations and flaws within it. Uh, I think it was made far worse by the changes that were made in the United States Senate under heavy lobbying from some of the same moneyed interests that I referred to uh, and the willingness to move to state-based exchanges uh, and the like. Uh, we're learning many other things about the Affordable Care Act in the course of its implementation on the can you keep the insurance uh, that you had? Uh, many of the attacks on the Affordable Health Care Act are much more flawed than it is. Uh, and uh, the problem that we've had uh, has been an unwillingness to discuss how to improve and change the act rather than just rejecting it entirely. In fact, um, about the, the first thing uh, that the current Congress did uh, a year and a half ago, in or a little more than that now, it was in January, was to vote the first time to repeal the Affordable Health Care Act. And the next day, they, uh, because they said it was repeal and replace, they uh, brought up what I called the 12 platitudes uh, in my speech against it, uh, which was basically a page and a half of 12 principles that they said they would like to have, many of which everybody in this room would agree on, like trying to preserve the doctor-patient relationship and the like. Uh, but uh, that was th that's been the extent of reform. And I haven't checked this week, but the last time, uh, just a couple weeks ago, I looked at the House uh, uh, dot com, the Republican House Republicans, I forget the exact name of their website, when you turn to what their alternative is on health care, it says in progress. And it's been in progress through 40 plus votes that have been taken to repeal the Affordable Health Care Act. Uh, and so until we can get through a process of finally accepting the fact that it's law and it will remain law and begin to look at the changes uh, that are needed in it, uh, I think we'll just continue to be engaged in a, in a political theater, uh, which is about all that's occurred. In terms of changes, I think, um, you know, I, want, I very much thought that there, there ought to be a public option as an alternative uh, to uh, private insurers in this bill that was taken out in the Senate. I thought we'd be better off with larger pools of insured sharing the risk uh, rather than dividing all of it up by state and within states in separate markets. Uh, we're learning a lot now about the impact uh, uh, on families of the Affordable Care Act. Despite the limitations it has and the changes I would like to see, uh, just within the, I guess it was last Friday night, I was speaking to the West Chamber of Commerce here uh, at their gathering and had met with their executive director. Finally, one night at midnight, after many tries, he went on to uh, uh, the website and managed to get an insurance policy that was significantly less than the one that he has today. It through that website. So I think that there are many, uh, if they ever get the website going, uh, as it should be, and implemented the way it should have been done before it was ever, unro before it was ever unveiled, uh, I think there are uh, great opportunities within the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I'm displeased with its rollout. I believe that we need to be looking at other alternatives within the Affordable Care Act, but I don't expect that much of anything will change in the law until after the current Congress. Other uh, thoughts? Well, I think we're getting Dean near our, our time uh, that you allotted, but I'm, I'm pleased. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.
we tell young people all the time, and you can vote they should. But what's, what's the solution that we can afford? Well, I think it is engagement. Uh, since we're nearing the end, I, I want to uh, renew uh, the request that any of our uh, students are here get involved, if not directly with our office, which we'd like to have you involved there in internship programs and the like, then with members of the city council, and the county commissioner's court, and the school board, and the other levels of government here. Uh, there is a major effort uh, to register people to vote, uh, to see that um, uh, Voter identification laws, so unfortunate to be adopted, do not stand in the way of people exercising the vote this time. Uh, convincing people that participating in this process can make a difference, when often it seems it makes no difference at all. I still basically believe uh, in the goodness of our democracy and the belief that we cannot drop out or we will turn the process over to those who may not have such good purpose. Uh, and I don't know any way other than what we've heard all our lives about the importance of registering, doing more than just registering to vote, but being, being actively involved with the political party of your choice uh, at the local level, right in your own neighborhood, and then being part of a, a, of a broader effort here in this county. There are critical elections up. Uh, this next year in in many parts of uh, from the judiciary and the county and uh, state delegations. Uh, and I think that participation is all that can make a difference. Uh, a lot of work in between uh, active political parties here. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. For an outcast audience, uh, the focus is on the constitutional amendment process, and if Congress won't pass constitutional amendments, convening a constitutional convention, which can be done. Uh, it's the same Congress that would consider the amendments that would have to convene the convention. I'm not quite to that point of thinking that a constitutional convention is uh, the way to resolve these problems. Perhaps some of it is because. If it's a constitutional yes. Convention, yes. Right. Uh, some of that may come from my initial experience long ago serving in the Constitutional Convention that was called uh, to uh, revise the Texas Constitution, which ended uh, unsuccessfully. 
though I think the need for amendment there is even greater. Uh, maybe the impact is not as far reaching, but the, the uh, and I, uh, I also have been resistant to constitutional amendments generally because of a time that I went through in Congress when it seemed like the, like the Texas Constitution, uh, there were some that viewed our U.S. Constitution like a municipal traffic code, that uh, you were putting in all of this minutia in there. Uh, I, uh, I have come to the view on Citizens United and money and politics that a constitutional amendment may be the only solution, but it's such a long-term answer uh, to get anything passed uh, in the constitu through the Congress by such a margin uh, and to get it approved by the states uh, that I again turn back to the notion that sustained citizen demand uh, for change uh, between elections and during elections through participation I think is a better hope than uh, through that constitutional process. So with that, I think we are to uh, have a chance to visit individually. I appreciate so much uh, the opportunity to talk with you and get your comments and questions tonight. And I plan to stay for a while. I have um, the staff members here who work with me in a small team uh, uh, down the street at our office. Uh, I'd like for you to meet them and to uh, visit some more about issues that are of concern to you in San Antonio. It's an honor to represent you in Washington. For those of you who are in the uh, strange district that I have that reaches from about Our Lady of the Lake, uh, the missions on the south side, all of downtown, this campus, out uh, uh, north a little ways to include the Pearl, and then wind around through Kirby all the way to North Austin. Uh, so as I said, I've had a chance to see a lot of Texas and now fortunately a lot of San Antonio, and I would want to continue devoting the effort to see that families in this county get the representation they're entitled to. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Dean.